John Hilton talks about being a radio broadcaster. I kept wondering what to say to you in this last talk, and then I had a bright idea. At least I hope it's a bright idea. I said to myself, suppose you give a talk about giving a talk. A talk about giving a talk, how do you mean? Why, how do you set about it, and the tricks of the trade and so on? Yes, that is rather an idea, I said to myself. So, here goes. There have been bits in the paper, sometimes, about my broadcasts. The bits I've always liked best are those that refer to John Hilton, who just comes on the microphone and talks. So different from listening to something being read. Oh yes, I like that. For, of course, I read every word of every talk. If only I could pull it off every time. You have to be on top of your form. Yes, of course. Every word's on paper even now. This. What I'm saying to you now. It's all here. Talking. Just as it comes to him. Right out of his head. I hope it sounds so. It's meant to. If it does, well, this is one of my good days. Tricks of the trade. Must I really tell you those? All right. The first trick of the trade is that there aren't any tricks. I mean, tricks don't come off. That's my experience, anyway. I've tried in my time, this way and that. I like experiments. I'll try anything once. But the little stunts and try-ons, no good. For me, I mean, of course. I think what listeners can spot more surely than anything else is any trace of falseness. I think you've got to find yourself, the radio rendering of yourself, and then be true to it. Truth, not tricks. For my sort of stuff, I mean, of course. But to read as if you were talking? Isn't that a trick? Oh no, that's an art, or a craft, whichever you like. In every art or craft, there's a technique, a method, a way. What is it here? Well, I suppose each has to find his own. But my notion is that to read as if you were talking, you must first write as if you were talking. What you have on the paper in front of you must be talk stuff, not book stuff. It's, in part, a mere matter of how you put words down on the paper. That very sentence now, that one you've just heard, it began with, it's in part. If I said to you, it is in part, you'd have thought, he's reading. In speech we say it's, not it is, so I write I-T apostrophe S, and not it is on the paper. I know if I wrote it is, I should say it is. I don't know anything about others, as I say, but my way is to speak my sentences aloud as if I write them. In fact, here's my second rule, all pet. To write as you would talk, you must talk while you write. If you were outside my room while I'm writing a talk, you'd hear muttering and mumbling and outright declaration from beginning to end. You'd say, there's somebody in there with a slate loose. He never stops talking to himself. No, I wouldn't be talking to myself, but to you. You can scrap, in writing a talk, most of what you've been told all your life was literary good form. You'd have to. If you want your talk to ring the bell and walk in and sit down by the hearth, You've been told, for instance, that it's bad form to end a sentence with a preposition. It may be in print, but not in talk. Not in talk. Come into the view that what I call the prepositional verb, I'm no grammarian, I invent my own names for these things, that is what I call the prepositional verb is one of the glories of the English language. You start with a simple verb like to stand, and with the help of a pocket full of prepositions, you get all those lovely changes. To stand up, to stand down, to stand off, to stand in, to stand by, to stand over, and twenty others. We score over the French there. The Germans have it, but they stick their prepositions in front of the verbs. I think our way has much more punch to it. And what bullseyes you, you can score with the prepositional verb, if only you'll search for it, and having found it, let the preposition come to the end of the sentence. You know how odd moments stick in the memory? One stays in mine. I was dealing with retirement pensions. I was tired. Tired to the point of writing that awful jargon that passes for English. I'd written something like, I don't want what I've said to discourage you from pursuing this question further. Rather, I would wish that my arguments should prove an added stimulus. At that point, I said to myself, Now, come on, John, pull yourself together. That won't do. What is it you're trying to say? And I pulled myself together, tired as I was, pulled myself together and searched and found it. I don't want to put you off. 
I want rather to set you on. That was all. What torment we have to go through to find what it is we're trying to say and how to say it in simple words. That was all. Two simple sentences. Put you off, set you on. Each ending with a preposition. At that point, as I wrote the script, I went for a walk round the houses. Two lads were talking as I passed. One had three dogs on a leash. The other asked as I went by, Why do you keep dogs for? I pricked up my ears at that, for more reasons than one, you know, but I'm always interested in the way people say things. Quite as much as in what they say. What do you keep dogs for? That was his fancy way of asking. Why do you keep dogs? It's most people's way. I fancy it's my way, as often as not. In my everyday speech, I mean. But suppose I'm writing a talk and want to ask a question like that in it. Which form shall I use? Shall I say why or shall I say what for? The first saves a word, and over the air a word saved in expressing a thought is a kingdom gained. A second not only wastes a word, but the sentence ends in the wrong sort of preposition, the one on which you drop your voice. What do you keep dogs for? So you'd say, use the first. Yes, but I like what I say to get home. And to get at that, lad, mustn't I use his form, not the best form? The times I've had to face that question. Popular English or good English? I think I mostly dodged it. There's an idiom, I believe, lies behind both. Behind both stiff speech and loose talk. I think if you can get back to that, the boy on the bike and the girl at the corner and the man at the works and the woman in the home will all feel the speech you're using to be perhaps not true to life, but something better, truer than life. It's a choice of word and a turn of speech that, if only you can get it, reflects through the very soul and spirit of our language. Comes down, of course, through Shakespeare and the authorized version, but there's nothing old-fashioned, nothing dead, and nothing done with about it. It's all alive and kicking. But it keeps to the homely words that belong to the oldest English and homely turns of speech. That's the way out I've tried to find. Sometimes I've felt I've really found it, and then won a thrill. How often I've tried for it and failed. I do believe that's all I want to say about the technique of composing talk. All I want to say here and now, I mean. It's all I can say, anyhow. But about delivering over the air what's composed? Ah, there I think I'd better keep quiet. Each has a way that best suits himself, or herself, of course. Each must find that way, his or her own way. Find it, one has to experiment, as I've said. You may even, I think, copy or mimic someone else's style now and again just to see if there's anything in it that fits you. But in the end, you've got to find your own self. Or rather, you've got to find or create a radio version of your real self. All that about being natural is no good, you know. Fine art's never natural, and only looks it, or sounds it. you got to find or create a radio version of yourself, the radio quintessence of yourself, and then write for it, and go to the microphone and act it, with truth and sincerity. Just two odd things from my own experience on the matter of delivery. My belief is that listeners hear speech, not in a sequence of words, one after the other, but in chunks. And what I try to do, though I may seldom succeed in my good intentions, is to throw out my words in bunches. Like that. And then pause long enough for the listener to take that bunch in. I don't know if that's right for everyone. I don't even know if others would think it right for me. But it's been my theory and what I've aimed at in practice, however often I may have missed the mark. The other oddment is this, the matter of speed. All over, average speed. Many of you have written to me from time to time. What you were saying was so exciting, but oh, I wish you'd gone slower. I missed some words. Yes, but if I'd gone slower, you wouldn't have been excited. You'd had written then and said, Why were you so solemn? You nearly set me to sleep. Oh, I know. You can't have it both ways. When I have gone slow, it's not been for that. It's been because of my many friends in Wales who have trouble following too rapid English, however clearly it may be spoken. Well, there you are. That's my last talk. A talk about giving a talk. It's a sort of, well, I won't say last will and testament, but at any rate, a testament. So now, I leave you for a year or two, 
I'm going to take things easy for a while, or try to. Then I must buckle to on all sorts of other explorations and enterprise. I know I shall have your good wishes. You have mine. Look after yourselves. Blessings on you.